Welcome to the Hermetic Astrology Podcast. I'm Gary Caton in the New River Valley of Southwest Virginia. You can find me on the web at dreamastrologer.com. And it's mid-September. Things are cooling off here in the mountains at least. Um, beautiful weather, a couple months of really beautiful weather that we have in the spring and the fall around the equinoxes. Um, really, really pleased about that. Uh, we're entering eclipse season. The nodes of the moon are still in Aries and Libra, but we're going to have the first um, lunar eclipse in Pisces, first of three lunar eclipses in Pisces. And right away, this tells you something, the fact that the node is in Aries, but the eclipse is in Pisces, that means there's a fair amount of separation between the nodes. And generally speaking, what that tells you is that this eclipse is situated um, within the family that it belongs to, that we call a Sero series. It's situated at closer to the beginning or the end of that. Um, and it also tells you that, well, first of all, it tells you that it's a partial eclipse, but it, because total eclipses would, the eclipse would be closer to the node. And the fact that it's not close to the node, it's not a total eclipse, tells you it's either at the beginning or the end of the Saros series. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, at some point. Um, but this idea that there's going to be three ec lunar eclipses in the sign of Pisces, and notably, there are no solar eclipses in Pisces this time around. And that's somewhat rare. Um, about once a decade, we'll have a sign that gets skipped in either the solar or lunar eclipses. Um, I was looking online uh, with the wonderful tool that they have there at AstroSeek. Um, and uh, if you just look at uh, what's going on right now, you can see, of course, that we have the solar eclipse, sorry, this lunar eclipse coming up on September 18th, 2024, at about 26 degrees of Pisces. And then next year, we'll have another one in September in Pisces. And then again, in late August, the year after. So we're having three lunar eclipses in Pisces three years in a row. So the full moon of late summer will be an eclipse for three consecutive years. So that's a little, that's slightly unusual. And if you want to see what I was talking about, um, there's a catalog of solar eclipses and lunar eclipses down here at the bottom. You can click on and you can look and see, like, for instance, in the mid-20-teens, um, we had uh, solar eclipses happening in Scorpio, Taurus, Scorpio, Taurus, Scorpio, Pisces, Virgo, Pisces, Virgo, Pisces, right? So we skipped entirely the signs of Aries and Libra, which is interesting. I mean, I'm not complaining. I got a lot going on. <laughs> And that was, and so, and it, and it was actually, you know, I was very much a very uh, busy, happy camper at that point in time. It's interesting there were no eclipses to kind of disrupt things, um, and so every once in a while you get lucky like that where you'll have um, a vacation from the eclipses. Um, but but this time around there's three eclipses in Aries, so which the normal amount is about two each time the nodes go through. So it's interesting. One time you get less, next time you get more. Um, this particular time to understand that there's three lunar eclipses in Pisces and no solar eclipses is an interesting thing to think about. Um, typically, the difference between solar and lunar eclipses is one of um you know the sun being the idea of self and self-awareness solar eclipses are usually more personal they often have to do with uh, leaders 
solar figures, etc. The, the light of the sun is literally getting interrupted. Whereas with the lunar eclipses, um, the, lun the moon will never be completely interrupted during an eclipse. The shadow will fall on the moon and it will turn blood red in a total eclipse or it'll have like a bite taken out of it during the partial eclipse like we have this time around. Um, and so that's a, a little bit different deal. And the lunar eclipse being by definition a full moon, it has to do with, um, well, being about the moon, it has more to do with emotions and like inner experience. But it also has to do with relationships because the sun and moon are opposite. So this opposition um, has the nature of um, like first and seventh house, right? There's this relationship. And so we will see um, the effects of lunar eclipses more through the mirror of others rather than just really being personal and self, um, self-directed like in a solar eclipse. And so we have three um, lunar eclipses in the sign of Pisces, which is really interesting because as we go along, I'm going to talk about how the sign of Pisces is being really tremendously accented right now. And, 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 and when that's done, when that moves the nodes and Neptune, for instance, when the node, the North node moves into Aries, and um or moves from aries sorry and uh neptune and saturn move into aries that's going to be a really big transition and we're going to talk about that a little more later um for right now let's take a look at the uh the chart of this particular eclipse that's coming up um it's a it's a partial eclipse, and we can see that right away because the distance between the node, which is still in Aries, and the eclipse itself is about 11 degrees. But when you have some distance between uh, the node and the eclipse, that signals right away that it's a partial eclipse, not a total eclipse. And it also tells us something about how the eclipse is situated within its family. Um, eclipses occur in uh, a series they're called a sero series there's like 70 eclipses that occur at 18 year intervals over thousands of years and we call these sero series but to me they're like um, a particular tribe of dragons that that kind of come in and take over and, and turn things upside down you know because in the mythology particularly in the Vedic mythology, there's this idea of this dragon or this um, demon that swallows the sun or the moon. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the West, we call these, the nodes, you know, Cauda Draconis, Caput Draconis. So there's this idea of this dragon that's involved. So I think of these Sero series as kind of these dragon tribes this family of dragons and there so there's about there's roughly about uh in this particular series there are 73 there's 70 ish in any given series and this eclipse is number 52 of 73 and the fact that it's a partial eclipse tells us that it will occur either early in the series it'll be like a young eclipse or an older eclipse because the total eclipses happen in the middle of the series. We'll talk more about that as we go along. But um, the first thing to notice with this eclipse, of course, is that it's conjunct Neptune in the later degrees of Pisces. So there's this sense of um, endings, completions that comes with being at the end of the zodiac. And there's this sense of universality, of um, transcendence, of um dissolving into the cosmic ocean right that goes with both pisces and neptune um so there's this very collective sense that comes um along with this as well and this is a north node eclipse so there's so there's a um 
there's an influx of energy that's coming in through this portal. Um, <clears throat> and energetically, we might feel that in our lives as something, if we're, if you think about it, ex experientially, if you're, if you as a system, let's think of each of us as a system of energies. And if our system is full, we don't have a lot of room for anything new something new trying to come in it's going to necessitate the exit of something else for it to even be able to have a place to be so you can experience so the nodes are very interactive that way we can experience even a north node eclipse which is about new energy coming in we can experience it as oh a, a loss or something or or a drain or or um or like um, being aware of like old patterns that that are holding us back and so forth. And that's because this new energy needs a place to be. And it's only through the exiting of the old stuff that there's room and space for the new stuff to come in and, ha and have a place to hang out and integrate, you know? Um, so yes it's a north node eclipse it should be about new energy coming in but we can experience that in sort of um counterintuitive ways um depending on you know if we've been clearing out and we're um and we've you know had some closure recently like it, it may just be like ooh, like yeah okay i've got space for this energy and here it comes and wow, I'm ready to take it on. Um, but it is very much like a collective energy. It's very much a cosmic, transcendent energy. And honestly, for for your average person, that's a bit overwhelming, you know, to have uh, an eclipse in the last degrees of Pisces in and of itself. And then when you add the fact that it's conjunct a transpersonal planet, a planet that is you know, beyond the cycle of a average human lifetime, in fact, twice, twice the length of an average human lifetime. It's, it's a bit overwhelming. And, and, um, you know, right now we have this setup where uh, Uranus is in the last degrees of uh, Taurus and Nep and Pluto is in the last degrees of Capricorn. So it's, they're, they're all three um, kind of, working together in concert all three transpersonal so this is a really this is a lot of transpersonal energy um so getting caught up in like some kind of mass movement getting caught up in some kind of spiritual like um whether it be i mean it could be um something like a, a spiritual awakening but it could also be something like um you know, recognizing how um, we are sort of um, controlled by our ideals, controlled by the, um, whether it be our ideals or, I, or our ideology or like with Pluto sneaking back into Capricorn, it could be an awareness of how like um just the way that our lives are structured it leaves it it leaves us with no room for certain kinds of experiences and this um because capricorn is like a closed hierarchical structure you know and so there's certain things that are just forbidden you know and this this um pisces eclipse is is way beyond anything like that you know, and so it might. So even though there's a sextile between Pisces and Capricorn, um, you know, the, the difference between Earth, which is very, you know, dense and grounded and, and water, which has no boundaries and, you know, just loves to flow is is actually quite stark here. Um, so, yeah, it could be it could be a lot could be something that you might want to give yourself a day or two or three to really deal with if you have that opportunity. Um, a couple things that are interesting about this eclipse is that um, 
it's co-present with Saturn. So Saturn's also in Pisces. So that's going to, um, it's going to make, you know, make it, there's fears and hangups and um, limitations that are sort of in the neighborhood of, of this really transcendent energy. So there might be this really polarized of like, oh, there's this limitless energy, but there's this very limited ability to deal with it or something like that. Um, there's also a square to Jupiter in Gemini um and which jupiter will tend to just expand things and so there's so anytime you get jupiter and neptune together that's a very like jupiter tends to just expand and neptune tends to dissolve and so there's this really wide open energy between jupiter and neptune and there's this other energy of saturn that really wants to ground and structure and limit um how much of that um is really available or 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 sensible or so forth so you know and there's a there's a square between jupiter and saturn that is mm, we've had the first square and this is technically you know saturn's retrograde and jupiter's still direct so we're not we're not applying to the next square yet until jupiter stations Jupiter's not far from stationing though. So this so there's a lot of these social planets, Jupiter and Saturn. There's a lot of um political, socio-political, uh, uh socioeconomic. There's a lot of that kind of stuff, that kind of noise. Often I experience it as noise that's also contributing, um, that may be either um a push to like it might push us to like in seeking to get away from that and find quiet and peace we are led into the transcendent or it could be that um it presents some kind of problem that we feel the need to find a transcendent answer for The other thing that's notable besides the co-presence with Saturn and the square with Jupiter is the trine from Venus to Jupiter, even though it's a separating trine. Venus is also conjunct the bright, benefic, fixed star Spica in this um, eclipse chart. And so that's between the trine of Venus and Jupiter, the two benefics, and the fact that Venus is conjunct Spica, that goes a long way towards sort of ameliorating any malefic vibes that you know this is not a blood moon so you don't have that really intense you know eerie feeling necessarily um and then with this venus and libra and really benefic fixed star um and and trying jupiter that kind of takes the edge off a little bit and gives maybe some um peaceful energy peaceful ways of um integrating this massive uh transpersonal influx <clears throat> now as i said eclipses exist within families they exist within what's called a sero series this was discovered by Babylonian astronomers thousands of years ago um every 18 years you'll have another eclipse with the similar geometry um it'll be at the same node of the moon it'll be at the same time generally the same time of year it'll be you know the it'll share the same astronomical characteristics whether it's near apogee or perigee and so on and and so they are related and it, I have found that it's really fascinating to look at these, but <clears throat> one thing to understand about these is that um, I'm not sure about the paths, actually, now that I think about it with the lunar eclipses, but with the solar eclipses, like a North Node series, for instance, so the first 
eclipse of the series would be at the North Pole, and then it would it would gradually wrap itself around the Earth twice and end at the South Pole, so that the eclipse series, the series as a whole, becomes like this Gnostic serpent or this Orphic, uh, like this Orphic egg that you see the pictures of this egg with the serpent wrapped around it. Um, <clears throat> you get this picture of this thousand year old serpent that's like slowly wrapping itself around the earth and teaching lessons of like <laughs> really deep wisdom. I imagine that thousands of years in parts, you know? And so it, I think it's really, really important to understand these, um, these eclipses in those terms. And the the particular um Saros series that this eclipse belongs to is Saros 118. So if we just Google Yeah, lunar eclipse. If you look usually, yeah, Saros 118. So by the way, I pref vastly prefer the the NASA numbering of these series to the Brady. It's just a lot easier to keep things organized. Um, so what we find is that um, this series began in March 2nd, 1105 uh, CE. And then if we scroll down, you'll see, so there right? There's penumbral eclipses, which is just like the edge of the shadow. Then there's partial eclipses where you get the bite out of the moon. Then there's total eclipses, which is like the blood moon. And then we get back into the partial eclipses of which this particular eclipse is the last partial eclipse of this series. So it's number 52 out of uh, 73 total. So if you think about about it like you know as a life cycle you begin with these like little baby eclipses you know that are not really very powerful hardly even noticeable like nobody notices them um, and then you get these partial eclipses like teenager young adults then you get these total eclipses which is like a powerful adult in the middle of its life you know capable of making an impact in the world and then you get, then you begin to get these partial eclipses again, which would be like, you know, an older person, not quite as vibrant as they were in the middle of their life, but still packing some oomph. And, and, and in fact, maybe a little more wisdom than they did when they had the, their full power, you know, and so this would be something of like an early elder eclipse is, is, is the way I would characterize it. Um, but I have found it really interesting to go back and look at the chart of the initial eclipse in the series. So in this case, um, March 2nd, 1105, if we take a look at that briefly, there's a few things that, that are really interesting. So March 2nd, 1105, the series began with a North Node eclipse in Virgo. So there's this polarity between Pisces and Virgo um, going on between the two. But you'll notice that a couple things, the um, there's a there's actually a um, sextile to Jupiter. In the, in the current eclipse, there's a square to Jupiter. So we still have an aspect to Jupiter, but in this case, a soft aspect. And in the current eclipse, we have a co-presence with Saturn. And in the Saros chart, we have a square to Saturn. Um, and then once again, we find that um, Venus is trying Jupiter 
in the um, in this arrows chart. So these are three aspects that are shared between the two charts. And so those three things, the um, the moon's interaction with Jupiter and Saturn um, and the interaction between Venus and Jupiter that kind of stand out. So once again, like um, there's also something interesting going on here, which when we begin to look at the history, um, and I had to look for this, so it's not like, you know, this, but the the signs Aries and Virgo are known to be what's called antitia to one another. That is, they are equal distance from the solstice point of Cancer. And so when you look in this chart, the moon and Pluto are roughly antitia. It's kind of wide, but you'll see why I'm bringing it up here in a minute if we just look at the midpoint between... Um, moon and pluto it's roughly about two degrees of cancer so it's not most people use like a one degree orb for these kind of things but it's not insignificant because when we begin to look at the um the members of the sero series it, what's interesting is if we go back and we look at the last eclipses that happened in the Cero series, it was in uh, September of 2006. Well, 2006 was the infamous year. It was a couple weeks before this was when uh, the International Astronomy Union uh, demoted Pluto. <laughs> and so um i was i was curious like okay how does pluto figure into this um into this saros chart and i didn't see it right away but yeah there's there's a there's an antitia between the eclipse the moon in in the saros chart and the and and antitia what that means so because zero cancer, zero, ca and, and Saturn is also on the world axis here, right? Zero Aries, zero Libra, zero Cancer, zero Capricorn, and the midpoints, which would be the 15 degrees of the fixed signs. Those, those are known as like the world axis. So there's often like socio-political things that go along with that. So in terms of the Zodiac, you have those points. In terms of planets, you have Saturn and Jupiter, so the fact that the um, that the moon and Pluto are activating the world axis in this chart and you have Saturn also activating the world axis and you have aspects between the moon and the two socio-political planets, Jupiter and Saturn, there's a lot of socio-political energy in this chart. And um, so it's not surprising Um there was a couple other things in 2006, but nothing that I really remember as needing to needing attention. In 88, it's very interesting. Al-Qaeda was founded around August 11th. Um, so a couple weeks before this. And then the and what's interesting is the thing which nobody would have known at the time, right? Because it's a secret meeting, but we found out later. Um and then, so that goes kind of with the moon Pluto thing. And then the Iran Iraq ceasefire of the Iran Iraq war happened uh, just about a week before this eclipse. So, um, yeah, you can see how there's like some, some socio political currents. Generally, eclipses are, are going to be active that way, anyways. Um, <clears throat> But you can kind of see that idea of like there's a north node, there's some new energy coming in. So Osama bin Laden gets together with his terrorist buddies and founds uh, Al Qaeda. All right, so so we talked about the eclipse chart. We talked about the Saros chart. Um, let's. Yeah. So one thing that also that stands out to me is that um, if you understand the Venus cycle like I do, 
there it's interesting because there's a very there's a very important alignment that will happen here in the venus cycle that will happen near the same degrees of this eclipse but later in february in early february um the venus cycle i'll show you a diagram of that So the Venus cycle has, in this part of the evening star cycle, it has a series of seven conjunctions with the moon where each month the moon, the waxing moon is like pulling Venus up higher into the sky. And so there's a series of seven of these. And then Venus reaches her maximum brightness at the seventh conjunction, um, which happens around February 1st, where at 28 degrees of Pisces with the North Node and Neptune. So if this, if this eclipse is bringing in a rush of transcendent, transpersonal energy, then that, that um, final conjunction of the Venus cycle is doing so even more because what you'll see when we do that right now, where we're at is um, we're basically between conjunctions uh, two and three in this series of seven that, that sort of go up the ladder, if you will, or up the chakras, if you want to think about it that way. But when we dial up the last one on February 1st, what you'll see is we have the moon and Venus there at 28 Pisces, along with the North Node and Neptune, all within about 10 arc minutes of one another. And it's really interesting, in fact, how this uh, conjunction lines up. I mean, you have Jupiter lining up with, with and the sun lining up with the angles of this eclipse chart. It's just kind of freaky. Um, and so there's like this um, crescendo of energy in the Venus cycle that reactivates this eclipse degree in about six months. And again, this is only just about a month before Neptune goes into Aries for the first time. Um, and so before we get there, you know, this, so Venus is in a Leo cycle. And what, what I mean by that is when Venus made her first appearance in the morning sky, which would be back in August of 2023, Venus was in Leo. So the first appearance in the sky, Leo, that sets the tone for the entire cycle. And this is this is a, a way of looking at the cycle that comes from the teachings of Daniel Jamario. He got it from Clyde Hostetter, a book called Star Trek to Hawaii. And Daniel passed it to Adam Gainsburg, who passed it to me. Um, and I've passed it to various people like the ladies in Spain, Olga and Paloma and and so on. Um, but this and, and there's a lot of people who are who are working with the cycle this way. So we might think of the overall tone of this Venus cycle as belonging to uh, Leo. Um, but the final sort of crescendo of the evening star is going to be happening at, at the very end of the cycle is going to be happening in Pisces. So there's this sort of, if you think about Leo as like this creative artist, you know, self-expression, like just really being in the, in your own personal solar light and, and Venus being exalted, excuse me, in Pisces and, and, um, and really just flowing with like the the cosmic you know agape universal love of, of of um you know without boundaries without limits without um preconceptions just like you know total um unconditional love you know that's wow that's that's really a lot of energy that's coming in there in february and and so this in a way, this lunar eclipse might actually just be a preview of what's available in the Pisces house of your horoscope. Um, and, and it'll be um, 
coming up to be more um more um intensely experienced even in uh in february now and this this of course leads to one more thought that i had which is that you know this is only just before if we look you know let's just dial this down to like weeks so it's like one two three four five six seven eight nine it's about two months later neptune enters aries and this is really an interesting situation because what you have to understand is that um ever since Pluto ingressed Sagittarius, which happened like way back in the middle 90s, you know, um, back when I was still a kid <laughs> or a young adult anyway, a kid in many respects. Um, Pluto, when Pluto entered Sagittarius, what we had was a situation where, and let's just dial it back so I can show you. Um, yeah, when Pluto entered Sagittarius, Neptune was already in, in uh, Capricorn and Uranus in Aquarius. So all three um, outer planets now were in the last four signs of the Zodiac. And this is very interesting because very early in my career, I studied with a guy by the name of Glenn Perry, psychological, modern psychological astrologer. But he he, he taught me about this model and I, might, might be, you know, in other teachings, but this is where I got it from. And he talked about this idea of the first four signs being personal, the second four signs being interpersonal, and the last four signs being transpersonal. And this makes a lot of sense to me in a lot of ways. I mean, I remember teaching this to a beginner class. Well, let's just go through it first. Um, so the first four signs of the zodiac, um, they're just they just they're they're characterized by a very personal reaction to life. So if we just like want to give a mantra to each of the first four signs, we could say that Aries is just I am. Like Aries is just like, I'm here, I'm full of life, I'm I'm showing up, you know, I am. And Taurus relates through I have, Gemini through I think, Cancer through I feel. So it's all about these personal reactions, whether it's just whether it's just being, you know, cardinal fire or possessing fixed earth or or um mental interaction with mutable air or or um, emotional um, uh, ownership through cardinal water there's this so I, I am I have I think I feel this very personal reactions to life and then when we get to Leo the interesting thing about Leo you know they love being on stage and but to be on stage implies another even if you're alone practicing your routine for eventually being on the stage, you're practicing for an audience. So there's an other implied with Leo. Of course, there's another implied in the idea of service. Service to whom? Service to, at the very minimum, God, um, which is another is a transcendent kind of other, but typically there's humans involved. Libra, of course, is the sign of relationships, so the other is like very obviously apparent. Scorpio, the other, there's a power dynamic usually um, that Scorpio is interested in exploring. So there's these four signs that are that are about this interpersonal dynamic. And then in Sagittarius, the other becomes God, the search for a higher truth, God or the law or the truth, philosophy, right? Um, in, in Capricorn, the other becomes the state um and in aquarius humanity 
in Pisces, the universe, right? So you can see how these last four signs really begin to um, dramatically expand on what was very um, personal in the first four and then expanded to include other people in the second four. And now they become very universal, very um, collective oriented in the last four, right? And um, we can think about this somewhat in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, this is my addition. I'm not sure. I can't even remember. It's been a very long time. In fact, it was the mid, it was, well, it was the late 90s, probably when I studied with Glenn, maybe the early 2000s. Um, so I'm not sure if this is my addition or if he mentioned it, but um, in Maslow's hierarchy, your physical needs, you know, if we don't have a place to live, you know, if you're homeless, for instance, that means it's very hard to have good relationships because like you're constantly find, trying to find something to eat and somewhere to sleep. Um, if once we fulfill those needs, then it's easier to meet our social in relationship needs. And once we meet our social relationship needs, we're looking for, okay, what else is there? What, what, what is the meaning of life and so on, right? So it, there's a series of of um, higher needs that are, we're able to meet as we fulfill each one of these. Um, and so it's it's very interesting to think about what's been going on since the middle 90s when Pluto entered uh, Sagittarius. We've had all three of the transpersonal planets in these transpersonal signs up until about 2010 when Uranus entered Aries. But then we still had the balance of the three, two out of three, in the transpersonal signs with one of them in the personal. And, you know, you can think about this conflict between the personal and the collective that's raging within politics right now, you know, like the rugged individual is generally something that most people identify with on the right and like the group and, and you know, taking care of, uh, of um, you know, people who belong to our, you know, group, you know, is generally something that's thought of on the left. And there, there, there's been this stark divide during the 2010s between those two things. So, so, so there, beca there became this tension became between the personal and the collective became more apparent, right? Um, and what's going to happen when Neptune gets into Aries is that now you'll have two out of three in the personal signs. So there'll be this shift of what was what was um, really a dominant theme for a very long time of these transpersonal signs being very much populated by the outer planets. Now there'll be it'll be more towards the personal signs. And so you know, and this idea, for instance, um, that's that a lot of people are talking right right now uh, of free speech, right? Free speech is an individual right. It's supposed to. It, it was originally intended for people, for individuals, right? And and um, and in fact, in the United States, you know, it was thought that these that these rights that were enshrined in the Constitution are God given rights that are meant to be. This is somewhat my interpretation, but I'm pretty sure I'm fairly spot on with this. Um, you know, they notably there is separation of church and state in this country, but that doesn't mean they didn't believe in God. They just didn't want any one religion controlling the inter the uh, discourse around God. Uh, Jefferson was a deist, I think. Um, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Um, deists believe in God, but they don't necessarily identify as Christians per se. Um, they believe in sort of an architect, uh, you know, they, they would think of the God as sort of this architect who designed the universe. Um, but the idea that these rights come from the creator, they come from God and they're given to people, to individuals. Um, and that is the function of the state in fact, in, in a very libertarian sense, which the founding fathers were extremely libertarian, 
up until they got their own country and then they kind of changed course on that a little bit but there's a lot of libertarian ideals the the main function of the state is to be a protector and guarantor of those individual rights um and i don't mean to be uh preaching or anything here it's just interesting how um these concepts are kind of coming front and center and we have where we we have this clash between the personal and transpersonal that's already started to show up and it's going to be intensified when uh, neptune gets into aries in fact neptune enters aries um next year but then but then of course it goes back and when it when it finally enters aries for good that's when saturn comes into aries and you'll you'll have this situation where you'll have pluto in early Aquarius, uh, Saturn and Neptune in early Aries, and Uranus in early Gemini, and there'll be so there'll be this um, uh, there'll be this interesting um, you know some people call that a minor grand trine because there's a trine between Gemini and Aquarius, and then a sextile in the middle. Um, that's a topic for another for another conversation but that's sort of where that's the, the that's the next main big outer planet configuration that's kind of like where all this is heading and so um it's really interesting to me to see you know the eclipses beginning to happen in in pisces and then there's this dramatic culmination of the venus cycle in pisces and then shortly thereafter it, you have this transition to Aries where, and, and this is a very dramatic transition between like, you know, this, this transpersonal sign ruled by, you know, Jupiter and Venus and this personal sign ruled by Aries and Mars, sorry, uh, the sun and Mars. Um, it, 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 it's a, there's a lot of tension there. There's a lot of um, tension of opposites and uh, you know, Jung famously said this is where growth this is where this is the juice of life like without the tension of opposites there's no there's no push towards growth this is where consciousness comes from this is where growth comes from this is this is where every you know this is the universe was born between the conflict between light and dark and you know hot and cold and so forth um and so it it's not necessarily like something to be worried about but it is a rather dramatic and pronounced um, tension between these uh, opposing forces of collective and personal. And so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, we've certainly seen that play out in rather destructive ways before. Um, and, um, you know, there, yeah, like Uranus and Gemini um ultimately in 2028 we end up with the third uranus return of the united states of america um and the united states was born out of a global conflict we don't really call it a world war um but there was a conflict happening in europe there was a conflict happening here in north america and they were related so it's really a kind of a global conflict and um and and then you know if you just do the math it's really simple um yeah 80 you know 1776 you know the, the united states was founded right as uranus was crossing the ecliptic plane at its north node so the planet uranus was injecting its energy into the earth plane so we're a very uranian nation and it's it's easy to see by the fact that if you just add 84 to 1776, you get 1860. What's happening? The Civil War, you know? Um, and then if you add 84 to that, you get 1860 plus 84 is 1944, World War II, you know? And so there's been, so we were born out of a global conflict. And each time Uranus has returned, there's been this global conflict that has sort of taken us to the next level of, you know, fulfilling this vision of of the the founding um, 
and it it makes you wonder like what's going to happen this next time around right like we've had this global situation ever since the pandemic it makes you wonder like well did we get it early did we kind of get it over with early and maybe we can it's possible i mean there who knows what kind of orbs you use with this kind of stuff um but it's also possible that this conflict between the personal and the collective could you know become more pronounced now you know i already talked about world war ii and of course you know everybody world war three one thing i will say before i leave you is that i don't think if it is world war three i don't think it's world war three in the sense of something worse than world war ii and the reason why is that when you look at the um the mundane charts, you know, in mundane astrology, classically speaking, going back to like Abu Masar, ninth century Persian astrologer, um, he talked about like the major mundane charts were like the Jupiter Saturn conjunction and then, of course, the Mars Saturn conjunction. And if you look at the Mars Saturn cycle, they they would they said, you know, like the worst part of it was then when Mars and Saturn were conjunct in Cancer because you know that's the sign where both of them are in detriment and when you look at it it's 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 interesting like you can kind of see where that's like the height of the strife and then you know as it comes around to the opposite sign where they're both in rulership it's not nearly as bad um and in fact what's really interesting and i mean i looked at a very long time scale the only time every once in a while when you're dealing with superior planets particularly you you have these conjunctions between planets that are actually triple conjunctions that doesn't happen a lot with mars and saturn because mars is relatively quick compared to saturn jupiter saturn you get triples more often but there was a triple conjunction of mars and saturn in cancer during the world war ii era and that just doesn't happen again anytime soon and in fact, I don't recall it happening before then either. So that's pretty hopeful in the sense like there's no precedent for that event before or after. And so um, I'm certainly not trying to scare people into, you know, um, thinking that World War Three, like the end of the world or anything like that, anything apocalyptic. Um but it is, I think, important to understand like the cont the context and the flow of where these energies are going. Like this lunar eclipse, yes, it's in the final degrees of Pisces, and yes, there's going to be this very transcendent energy, and and um, and yes, there's also some socio political tension that goes along with it. And but it's not an isolated event, right? If when that's the thing that I've learned about astrology, like. You know, if you watch, you know, the sort of pop channels or it's like this series of disconnected events of like, oh, there's this event and rah, 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 and then there's another one and rah, 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 and it's just like, and, and, and it's like this endless chain of like um, these discrete separate events. But to me, like, that's the noise. You know, when you really begin to understand like the larger picture and understand like how various events are connected to one another and see the flow between them, that's where you can really begin to understand the signal, the true signal of what's trying to speak th through and, and like understanding where it's coming from and where it's going. Where it's coming from is this decades long emphasis of the outer planets and the transpersonal signs that began to change in 2010 will be taking the next change um next year in 2025 um and and then in 2028 you know the, the usa as a country has a very important return um so that's sort of the context and you know on a on just a more personal level this lunar eclipse is leading into the Venus cycle. And both of those, you know, the moon being, you know, feminine and the, and Venus being feminine, they're much more about our inner experience. 
So there might be, um, you know, something in, in, for me, there would have to be because like with that socio-political noise, like I have to tune that out from time to time. I tune into it just so that I'm not like totally lost. But um, more often than not, I'm like, okay, let me go out in the woods. Let me go down by the river. Let me be with the stars because I need to be um, to escape from that and sort of find my own inner peace you know and so there might be a, a real um strong availability of that in within with these two events like this lunar eclipse might be showing you something that's just a preview of something that will be even more powerful and available through the culmination of the venus cycle in february um which is really nice because in the midst of, you know, um, you know, John Lennon famously said, life is what is what happens while you're busy making other plans, <laughs> you know, and it, I find that to be very true, you know, um, you know, life is life, the world is the world. And, but, you know, what's, what's going on in here, you know, as a mystic, as, um, as somebody who is, uh, to me, that's the feminine path. The feminine path is about the internal life, the spiritual life. Um, and so that's really where my main focus, you know, needs to be. And there seems to be a really beautiful opportunity for to really um, tune into something that's much, much bigger than us, but that will be informing us about us at the same time um and maybe it's something that can help us to navigate all of this other noise that seems to be um you know coming to a really important um crossroads with this with this um uh with this eventual uh, transition from the collective signs to the personal signs you know? Okay, so that's what I have for you this time around. I know it's a lot. Um, we looked at the lunar eclipse. We looked at the Cero series. We looked at the Venus cycle. We looked at some long-term stuff with the outer planets. Um, and so, you know, the shelf life on this one is a while, so feel free to come back and review it. Um, certainly, the the main the main focus particularly with regard to our own personal situations is this lunar eclipse in the last degrees of pisces with with neptune um suggesting some kind of um transcendent experience of something universal something um something uh, some new energy coming in and sort of um, maybe even overwhelming us with this sense of like um, cosmic, uh, um, you know, universal love, um, universal without, you know, boundarylessness, right? Um, but at the same time, with Saturn co-present, there might be this hesitancy to like, uh, to be, or this inability to really grasp it, Um like, oh, that sounds good, but like, you know, <laughs> reality, you know, um, and, and so it might be that, you know, you get this glimpse of it now, um, and, and then later on when the Venus cycle in February culminates in this degree, it might be that, that whatever those Saturn limitations were that you're able, that you're able to, um, deal with those better. Saturn will be direct at that point in time. And so the, it, the, so this lunar eclipse might serve as something of a preview of this cosmic energy that's available that can then be more fully grasped and more fully uh, embraced at that point in time. Um, so yeah, if there's if you if you get even a glimpse of the kind of energy that I'm talking about with this eclipse, that's probably plenty. Um, at the same time, it could be kind of overwhelming. So if you if you find yourself 
needing to say, okay, like off this, I need to take a bath and some salt water and like, or like, you know, do some grounding or whatever. That is absolutely all right too, you know, because as we said before, you know, there'll be another opportunity to connect with this energy before we begin moving into the more, um, more of an emphasis on the personal signs. All right, so thanks for tuning in. Be sure to stop by dreamastrologer.com and sign up for my newsletter. I just sent out a newsletter where I was talking uh, about um, being on Camino with Olga and Ploma and how incredible that was. And uh, I'm going to be at Astromagia for this Saturday. Hope to see some of y'all there. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to give you a heads up about Inflation is still pretty high, and I haven't raised my rates in a while. So at the end of the year, I'm definitely going to be raising my rates. And so if you want to book at the old rates, next couple months is a really great time. If you've been thinking about booking a consult, please do so ASAP because um, November, December tends to be a little bit more family time and so on. And so um, September and October would be great. Anybody who's looking for reading, I've got some space. Um, the other thing is if you are interested in a membership, you know, the membership program that I have that I've been doing for several years now, it just keeps evolving. Um, I just sent out some uh, really cool Procyon talismans that I made um, when Mercury was conjunct Procyon a little while ago, I took a few of those on Camino with me and like, wow, the trail magic was incredible. I mean, literally to the point where like I'm going down the road and I get a flat tire and literally like within five minutes, totally unplanned, the support vehicle that was like my backup, I, I thought I was going to have to call them and be like, yeah, I'm over here, whatever. They just come driving by. <laughs> like I didn't even have to call them. I'm like, yeah, I think there's some trail magic going on here. Um, so that was really fun. And um, yeah, so every once in a while, I make some custom talismans from the elections. Each month, I put out a report, 30 to 40 pages. It's like a comprehensive deal, too. It, like, it literally takes you through for, like the theory these sort of rules and 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 so forth and the the way to construct an election and then it then i give you six different kinds of elections planetary decan uh fixed star lunar mansion um constellation and house-based talismans every month six different kinds of magical elections um and that's available at the uh intro level and then if you want uh, to step your membership up to the next level, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time and I've been documenting it since at least 2008 when I began this podcast. So what is that? That's like 12, 16 years. Wow. Two complete um, Venus major returns. So there's like a couple decades worth of recordings and stuff in the archives that you get access to at the next level. And then at the final level, it's for people who want to work with me on a regular basis. I have a couple people right now that I'm seeing once per week. Um, and, um, you know, the, you know, doing teaching and doing working more um, intensely and stuff. And so even if you even if you just want to meet like three times a year, four times a year, like quarterly, it's a good deal because the savings that you get offset the the membership um, contribution. So it's a good deal for anybody who wants more than just a reading or two each year. Um, so there's three levels of membership. You check that out. If you book before the end of the year, when the rates go up, your monthly membership contribution will be locked in. As long as you maintain that membership, you will keep that rate 10 years, if you like. I never raise rates on anybody. When I raise my rates, it's only from that point on. So if you want to lock in at the lower rates now, uh, right now is a great time to do that as well. Um, all right. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, 
hopefully this Pisces eclipse will be um, a, a, a taste of something that will be experienced even more beautifully later in February with the Venus cycle culminating in late Pisces. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you. Bye.